Hey guys, Deepay here. For those who don't know me, I was the former head coach and general manager of the Los Angeles Gladiators, and I'm here to talk to you guys about your favorite teams, and I'm going to do something a little bit different. Instead of talking about, you know, the next season, I don't really know about Overwatch 2. No one really knows what the hell's going on with Overwatch 2 other than the people in Overwatch 2. Uh, I want to talk about kind of your favorite organizations and how they've done holistically, specifically in the 2021 season and how they position themselves in the 2022 season. I want to give them, you know, that analytical view from a former head coach, a former GM's kind of perspective of how they built the roster, how they did throughout the season in terms of general head coaching style, stuff like that. And then how they are positioning themselves for the next season, how they view the next season conceptually. I think, you know, I have a really unique experience that I'm able to talk to the public about these things. So I really want to share that knowledge with you guys on why your orgs are making the decisions that they've been making, right? So let's get started with the Justice. I think the Justice are a really interesting team to talk about, mainly because of their history and what they've been doing to try to succeed in the league. So I'm not going to go deep in their history, but let's just say Washington Justice's history is a bit tragic at the beginning right we're talking about the 2021 2019 season it was filled with you won't recognize a lot of these players for people who are you know not diehard fans of the leagues i had to look this up i forgot about this roster i'm going to be honest but they constructed it off like you know the piggyback of the bench players of new york excelsior and really tried to you know make it a mixed team of their own i won't go into the details of why this didn't work i don't really care to know all the details of why this didn't work but basically it resulted in a very very bad record 8 and 20 is not great they were really bottom of the league in fact i think they picked up most of their wins at the end of the season right i think they were like 4 and 20 and then picked up like you know four wins three wins towards the end so they didn't do that well going into this season but it's really understandable you make a lot of mistakes as gms uh going into the beginning you're you're new into the scene you kind of have to pick up best available talent you're not really sure what that is this is really understandable but they've tried to stay mixed which is really you know that's been their identity in the 2019 season they tried to make it a mixed roster built around you know certain types of players and that's that's a good thing so going into the 2020 season again i don't want to talk about it too in depth let's just look at the results really quick i know the results aren't always the most important thing but I'm analyzing this from a competitive side type of thing. I'm not analyzing this from a business side type of thing, right? They went 4-17. and 17. It was pretty disastrous. They went mixed and, you know, I, I'm not going to retell, uh, retell the whole story. But basically, at some point, their Western parts either couldn't come from visa reasons or whatever. And then they pivoted, and pivoted into full Korean team, picking up um, Stitch, Janu, and Aim God. Uh, as well as Decay. Decay was probably the big story of the 2020 season, right? <laughs> they, he was the big story. He was their seventh travel eligible player, as it says. There were rules made for this type of player. He was picked up from uh, Dallas Fuel from this whole drama. Doesn't really matter. And then they have, you know, like this huge run in the playoffs for 2020. And then what do they do now? That That's really, you know, that's our starting point is what do they do now? This is 2020. Uh, we're going into the 2021 season. You guys had a randomly really successful playoffs. I'll say randomly. It's not like you guys built up to this. It's not like this team had a lot of time. They kind of just, you know, stumbled upon success uh, in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying it was lucky by any means, They, but it wasn't constructed success. What you want to do as a GM, it's always about constructed success. Okay, so we're going into 2021. One of the most important things, I will say the most important thing as a GM is to understand your position. In real estate, it's location, location, location. You've heard that that joke before. It's location, location, location. As GM, it's position, position, position. What do you offer that other teams don't offer? What are other teams offering that you don't have that you have? What is your comparative advantage in the market? These are things that you need to know going into any offseason. The justice, you know, what they have right now they're not sure. <laughs> They're really not sure. The thing that they know they have is fucking Decay. They have DK on their roster. They can convince him to stay and then move forward from there. And that's exactly what they do. I'm really, really happy. Like, I think this was a really, really smart decision. They could have kept, you know, any number of players like Aim God, Janu, uh, Stish, but they really tunneled in on Decay and were like, okay, Decay wants a full Korean team. I know this, you know, 
This isn't new information. He wants to join. Oh, he's always wanted to be on a full Korean team. How do we make this happen? We're building around decay. We think this guy is a championship level Ross, uh, championship level player. How do we build around this player? This can change our identity from you know eight and twenty. You know these percentages are awful. You know you're you're at a you know one in four chance to win type of situation over here, and you have DK. <laughs> Uh, on this roster, who instantly seems to miraculously turn it around, right? So, what offseason moves are we going to make? And I love the moves that they made. I, I love the moves that they were trying to make. You know, this is a really tall order. I think Justice, I want the next thing I want to talk about is spending. Uh, spending is directly related to how much do you want to win? How much investment are you willing to put in? Let's say the OWL, you know, salary cap is around 1.5 mil. Where do you want to be in that salary cap conversation? Do you want to be towards that salary cap or do you want to be, you know, 50K minimum times six players type of situation? Where do you want to be? The Justice throughout its past two years, you know, this is no secret that they paid a lot for these players. They were unsuccessful in the 2019 season and in the 2020 season, but they paid a lot for these players. So they are trying to be a good team. They just haven't been successful. They haven't made the right moves to do that in 2019. They haven't made the right moves in 2020. They're still investing a lot. And I respect this as an org. You want to do well in this in this league, you have to spend. Okay, that should put your expectations. You are not a budget team. You're not like looking to go 8-8 eight and eight and be like, hey, that was not bad, right? Like the Paris Eternal have done this past season. They went 8-8 eight and eight, and that was a miraculous season for them. They, you know, signed everyone on like essentially minimum contract. And then boom, they get an 8-8 eight and eight record on that. That's money ball right there. That's That's what, you know a lot of these owners want is give me maximum production for least amount of dollar. Justice wants to spend more. They want to win. They want to win. They want to be a really good team in the league. And I can respect that a lot. So what moves are you going to make? Build around Decay. Give them a good contract. Boom. That's piece number one. That's your position in the market. Uh, hey guys, we have Decay. <laughs> Decay is a very sought after player to play with because people think he is so talented. He is talented and he's a flexible player. Everyone thinks he can play everything. He can play everything. Decay is a great player to build around. Who do you get on this team? Mag. This is, you know, Mag and Fury to me, I don't know the order of these things. It says the order here, but internally the org is moving at a different rate, right? They're aware of all these moves that can happen. So you got to spend big on other championship quality players. Unlike in, say, basketball, there's one ball in basketball, right? And then you can have role players who don't touch the ball as much but have other really high value. In Overwatch, you need six great players to win. You need six great players to win. I think that is what Shanghai has shown. I think that is what Dallas has shown. I think that is what all the top teams have shown uh, this past year and all the years before. You need six great players to win. So how do you spend your money accordingly? I don't really care. Right now, you just need to get players onto your team. You need more than Decay to persuade players. You need great players on your team. Fury Mag. That's what we're talking about here. <laughs> those those upgrades on tank line are huge. They dropped everyone else. You know, as you can see, they dropped everyone else. Stitch Johnny Aim God leave. Roar leaves. You know, all these guys leave. There's Tuba and Decay. I have questions about Tuba, but let's let's leave him alone for a bit. Boom, you guys add Mag Fury to your roster. This this is a great start. You have Mag Fury Decay on this roster. This is the big three of your roster, right? This is what you're building on. Maybe you spent too much money on these guys. I'm not really sure about this. Fury uh, is a free agent this season. He comes from Philly, right? He's a free agent this season. No buyout. Mag has a buyout for a runaway. For those who don't know, buyout might not necessarily be related to your salary cap, but it is related to your internal company budget, right? So I don't know what Justice's budget looks like exactly. They've been willing to spend a lot. I would say on the higher end for sure. They're in the higher end for sure. But, you know, Mag is not a cheap player. Fury is not a cheap player just with salary, right? Like Mag is not a cheap player because of salary and buyout. Uh, Fury is not a cheap player just by his pedigree alone and his position in the market as a player, right? He can go to any team he wants. He's very, very desirable. Okay, so you spend a lot on these guys. Maybe you spend too much. Where do you go from here? I don't know exactly how much money, but they, they clearly spent a lot on these players, right? Where do they go from here? This is where I have, you know, a bit of problem, but I understand the decisions that they have made. They have made, like, reasonable decisions. I think if they had more money, they should have gone for Shu. 
you know, this is me speaking really biasly from when I was uh, constructing the roster in 2021 for Gladiator. Shu was the obvious top pick that was not sought after enough by teams. I don't know why Justice was not in the running for him. Maybe it was too much. Uh, you know, he has a history of boosting. Maybe that was a problem with some of the players there, some of the uh, coaches there. I'm not really sure. That talent cannot go to waste. There was Violet, who, you know, ultimately went back to shock. But I think that's someone worth talking to for sure. Those, those are the two big people, in my opinion, who are on the board. Past that, you kind of go a tier below. And I think Bebe is in this tier below, this A tier of support. They, they aren't this star-studded support, but they'll get the job done, right? That's kind of what you're looking for. I think there were other options here. And this is where I would want to spend a lot more money is flex support. I want to spend a lot of money on flex support. I saw from last year how valuable flex support was. From Iziaki, from Violet, I saw how valuable it was from the 2020 season. Where are my flex supports at? I don't think Bebe fits the quality of what you're trying to achieve here, but I don't know what the budget situation is at this point, and would I ever sacrifice not getting Mag and Fury going into the season? No. I'm really happy getting Mag and Fury into K and kind of building off that, and if other pieces suffer, that's fine. Because maybe, you know, Mag and Fury really wanted to work together. Maybe they had a connection with the K. All this stuff is something that you would have to research into the behind the scenes, right? Very, very complicated stuff, but also not that complicated. Ask players what players they want to play with see if they can get players you know that are free agents hey come to our team uh type of thing so we we talked about baby reasonable you you can't get shoe you can't get violet you can't get this s tier flex support player there it's hard to come by these like you know insane fraggers another person that i think flew under the radar my opinion still is lastro is insane lastro had a standout season in valiant Valiant was falling apart, so you salvaged the Valiant, uh, Valiant parts. Kai and Lastro were the clear parts of Valiant that were doing insane work on Valiant from the 2020 season. They had one of their, you know, Moneyball seasons that was insane for them. You needed to to at least consider Lastro again. There might be a problem with boosting. He has a problem with boosting. I think uh, in the past, you know, maybe he has a toxic reputation. Whatever it may be, I think these things are workable so long as you have the manager for it, you have the uh, head coach for it, right? I think these things are workable. But Bebe, not a terrible choice. I wouldn't have gone with him. He has a really good personality. He works really hard. I have no problem with him. Revenge was possible as well. Uh, Runaway, you know comes with mag but maybe cost too much coming from runaway baby is a free agent coming off of spark uh where spark no longer wanted him right so he he became free agent so really reasonable choice the next thing i want to talk about i don't want to dismiss main support but the next thing i want to talk about is who do you pair up with decay who the you know like you have decay and you need a dps that is comparable you 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 want to pair a really good dps with decay because DPS will get value off of each other, right? This is a very important thing in Overwatch. You know, you can't just have one sitting back. If everyone focuses Decay, the other DPS has to do something, right? Or they should be doing something from the very start. So you need a really good DPS. I'm not super happy with the decisions they made for DPS. One, they kept Tuba. I don't think Tuba is that great. He's a great Genji player. Uh, he's a good flex DPS, but he's not in the same quality as Mag mag fury and decay he's re he's really not in that same conversation i don't think we need to start talking about flex dps and why i think decay was misutilized on this team this is my opinion i think this is a very uh different opinion than a lot of head coaches but i have a very specific idea about these players like decay these players like kev these players like decay kev fleta you know these guys are all in the same breed they can play anything. They really can play anything. But should they be playing everything is the question. The flexibility becomes a problem. Decay, the natural thing that they did is they got a main DPS player, a hitscan DPS player, and then they got a projectile player to pair with Decay. They're like, okay, Decay's always playing, and then we'll just play the other one who whose you know, specialty will, will align. I think that's not really the case. For me, you want to go for the two of the highest quality DPS players that you possibly can. And for me, there were so many good hitscan DPS available on the market that year that Decay should have been, quote unquote, the flex DPS. Fleta has a similar career trajectory where he really could play anything. He was, in fact, known for his Widow a lot of the times in Season 1, uh, but he flexed off to Genji. And you see how Shanghai utilizes him and Lip. Lip is more a traditional hitscan player with a good tracer. This is much more common to find than someone like Kevster, someone like Decay. 
someone like Fleta. The, these guys don't exist. These guys straight up don't exist. You need to find other people that that can fill, like, be top at their role. And really, it's the hit scan. Not that Fleta isn't a good hit scan. Not that Decay isn't a good hit scan. It's just there are freaks of nature on hit scan, like Kai, like Ons, like, you know, these crazy people. Cor Corey is even on this list. Like, I would put these guys as crazy people on aim. Not that they're better players necessarily, but that they fill that role really, really well. And nobody really fills the flex DPS role that well comparatively, right? I'm even not even putting Pelican or Sparkle or Doha in these conversations because I don't think they're nearly as flexible as people like Kevster or Decay who can play hitscan as well. So I'm not even talking about get a great... If you paired him with, you know, Pelican or Sparkle or Doha or something like that, that would be great. Don't get me wrong. I think that is great. But I think you need to pair him with a high quality player, the highest quality player that you can. I don't think you look for roles. I think you look for highest quality players. And Decay will fill kind of, but... He's really best off as a flex DPS that can go to hit scan. And if you have two high quality players, you can go through that. That's my opinion. I think that is where kind of this roster divulges a bit. Instead of going for one high quality DPS player to pair with Decay, they have three pairings with him between, sorry, I haven't shown the 2020 roster, <laughs> between Assassin, Jerry, and Tuba, when really you just want one good player next to Decay. You want one good player next to Decay. You want one great player, sorry, next to Decay. You don't want three good players next to Decay because only one of them can play. And, you know, this guy and this guy, same hero pool for all intents and purposes. Same, similar hero pool. So, you know, I really disagree with spending the money this way. Uh, this might have been the best available talent that they saw on at the time, but I know that there was better talent available to pair with Decay. I would have spent way more money on one good DPS next to Decay Doha was possible, I think. I'm not really sure, but, you know, you can find someone to pair up next to Decay. I don't have my DPS list here with me from the 2021 season, but that's where I'm I'm a little disappointed, but very understandable why they did this. They like Tuba from the other seasons. He has given them good production, and I think Jerry, like, uh, I'm not speaking ill of these players. I think Jerry and Assassin and Tuba are good players. Jerry, like, is someone who I always had high regard for, but I just don't... Do I think he can be top tier? Maybe with time, but is he top tier now? No. Uh, can he be? Yes, but is he there now? No. Assassin, I think, you know, a proven player from Runaway, but I personally don't rate him very, very highly individually speaking. I think he's average for a Flex DPS, which again is why Decay is so valuable. It goes from average to great really fast in the Flex DPS conversation, and uh, he's not one of the greats, is my opinion. So, okay, we're talking about the DPS. We're done talking about the DPS. Let's talk about main support. I was always really high on Closer mechanically. Like, I always felt like his mechanics on Lucio, on Brig, on Mercy were really, really high. His greatest season was the one he got benched in. <laughs> London season one, uh, he got benched for Nuss in the playoffs uh, towards the end, right? He, he was really good for them throughout the season, but they ended up with Nuss in the end, who won the championship for them. Not him single-handedly, but that roster did. Closer, I think, is really a high-quality player, and I'm happy with this pickup. Personally, I'm very happy with this player pick up okay we talk about the 2021 season how they constructed this roster the next thing we need to talk about is how did we go from this from a mixed roster to a korean roster this happened because decay this is what i mean by position 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 it matters a lot this is why mayhem has shifted you know albert yes said like you know these were the best players available at the market this was like the most logical thing to do at the time but you get in yourself into a hole because building out of a korean roster if they ever wanted to pivot back for structural reasons for you know justice is an american org how much korean appeal is is important for their business standard i'm not really sure i don't know their practices but if they ever wanted to pivot back you will end up looking a lot like the just uh sorry like the titans uh, so this is a risky decision, but you have to keep going down this path. So the GM, whoever has made these decisions has to understand that they have made this, they have built around Decay and building around Decay means a Korean team and building around the Korean teams means you're going to be there for a long time, right? And pulling out of it is going to take a lot of money or, you know, you're going to have to work with being bad for a while to get the best available Western talent. So you know, that's a sacrifice the GM has made, that whoever has constructed this roster has made. Either knowingly or not knowingly, this is what they have done. So that's how we ended up here from the, you know, 
I, I these were lovable misfits type of guys over here. I remember <laughs> uh, to here. These guys are really like look at baby's face. Look at these guys' faces. They're so happy. Uh, but you know this might change your business model from you know an American business model. These guys are owned by I, I'm pretty sure an American company uh, to owning a Korean team, and that has a lot of complications with that, right? But if you want a black box of success, boom, hire a Korean team. This is this is a good start. So. You know, we have talked about Justice 2021 roster construction, talked about some of the failures of it. We've talked about some of the successes of it. Overall, I'd rate it pretty good. You went from a team where I think you're going 4-17. and 17. I think that's pretty accurate. You pivoted full Korean. You piggybacked off your success. You know, I think, you know, a bit lucky in terms of not, not design sex, success going into the 2020 playoffs. And you jumped off of that you leapfrogged off of that into building a really good roster again i think the k fury mag this will always be a really good roster no matter who you put up beside it i think it will be a good roster so i'm really happy with this i think you have piggybacked off your guys' success and move forward you will need to do more building unless you have done this before you know you don't know the perfect iterations of your roster you have iterated from you know a bottom place team to what i think can be a top place team Let's talk about the 2021 season. And I'm not going to talk about every particular match or whatever it may be, but let's talk about coaching. Let's talk about how this team, while it's constructed, it's constructed, but how are we going to utilize this? This is where I'm a little disappointed. And we can look at the results. I, th I think looking at the standings are really important for all the, se all, the, all the tournament cycles, right? There were four tournament cycles, and I want to talk about this. So there was a huge volatility in performance just throughout the year. And where was this team's identity? I think was a lot of the questions going in. What justice are we seeing today, right? That was like often a question that I think is going to be asked by people who are scrimming them, by, you know, even the the casters were saying this, like, what justice are we getting today? We're not really sure. They can go 4-0 and in May Melee and look fantastic, dominating, right? 12-3 map score. Or, boom, they're, they're down here. They don't even make the play-ins, right? They're certainly better than the Boston Uprising from a talent perspective. How are they not better than them here? And then boom, they go three and one again. And then back down. So where is the progression? Oh, wow, they were the worst team. Where is the progression of this team? You, you've gone backwards. You know, you, you normally want to see a team go like this in terms of progression. I feel like Gladiators went like this in terms of progression. A lot of the teams, you know, you saw them just getting better and better and better. Or, you know, stayed even. But Justice just... It's it's like one of these crazy charts. You don't want to be one of these crazy charts uh, as a team. So where has your progression been? What have you been working towards throughout the season? What is your big idea as a coach? And this is where I have the biggest criticism is I felt like they didn't have that big idea as a coaching staff, as a team. I would say that they're very obviously a player run team. Uh, I, I know a little bit about Supreme. He's much more like a player manager and that's fine. Just to be clear, I know Moon is more of a player manager too and Shanghai has seen success. Uh, this style of coaching is fine, but you need to have strong direction from players, from coaches, assistant coaches, somewhere else. You need to have a direction so that you guys can progress, you guys can find your identity and move forward. I wasn't really happy with this. They never really showed up in any big matches. We'll show results, I think. They have lost, you know, every playoff match they were in besides this Houston Outlaws play-in tournament at the very end. Classic Justice, you know, pulling it together at the end. Yeah. Where was the progression? This is actually what I want to talk about is this scoreline right here. I think they made the correct pivot at this moment. They make the correct coaching choice or team choice. Whoever did it, it was correct. They just went hard into Lucio comps. They went hard into Lucio comps. As you can see, the, the metas where they got to play Rush, the first and the third, are where they saw the most success. They saw most success playing rush they saw most success with lucio moira uh basically it's follow the team follow mag and push all the way in i think the problem with this is you lower decay's value a lot because decay is a solo player who doesn't want to go with the team he wants to do his own thing and he gets a lot of value doing his own thing much like kev you know kev won't be utilized as well in these like team play matchups he, he's the more space you give Kev, the more things he'll be able to do. The more freedom you give a player like Kev, like Decay, the more freedom they're going to have. So uh, I think you gimp your your star DPS player there, but you accentuate your tank line. You accentuate Mag, and you accentuate Fury. So 
I'm very happy about this decision. This is probably the strongest part of their whole team is their tank line. Let's play around them, follow them in. Lucio, push in. And I think this is Closer's best hero. I think Bebe, you know, I don't think he's a standout flex support. You know, going into the season, like I said at the beginning of the video, I thought he was probably an A-tier support. I, I probably think his performance in this thing, in, in this year, B tier, right? Like, I, I think a tier below A tier or like bottom A tier. He was worse than I expected. But, you know, on Moira, he he did like quite well. He followed the team, made sure he, he got in. Uh, and to be honest, your, your value on Moira, you can be a really great Moira. I think Fielder is like one of the only exceptional Moiras in all of Al. The rest are kind of just like everyone is similar level. Fielder is exceptional, really exceptional. I'm not really sure. I, I, I know why he's exceptional, but I'm not sure why like it's so hard to replicate that. But Justice, yeah, I, I'm really happy with the decision that they made going into the playoffs when they played against the Outlaws. I think they had a far worse comp. I know Zen Brig beats Lucio Moira on this patch. I'm like certain of it because we have scrimmed these teams and we have beat them thousands of times. Like, this this was the wrong thing, but this was the right thing for them. Much like how Dallas, it's the right thing for Dallas, and it was the right thing for Shock. <laughs> uh, who, all of the, those three teams made the playoffs, right? It was right for them, just like Zen Ball was, was best for Gladiators, right? It was best for them, and while it was a really close match with Outlaws, and I think Outlaws was running the better comp, they found their better part of the, their identity in the last part of the year and leaned into their strengths. The problem with their strength is that it's everyone else's strengths in NA. Are they going to be Chalk in the Rush matchup? No. Are they going to be Dallas in the Monkey matchup? No. Who are they Who are they beating, you know? They beat Outlaws, and then they will fizzle out in the tournament. But this is the best possible decision you can get to go into playoffs, so I'm happy with it. I think they didn't really fully realize their potential. We talk about roster construction. Hitting the full potential is up to the coaches, up to the players in that season, right? They're set up for success in a lot of ways, but it's up to the coaches to really get the most out of them. I don't think they lived up to their full potential, but by the end, I think they made the right decision. So, Justice, while I think they had a shaky start, boom, they started finding more and more of their identity. So I'm really happy with that. And they they did it to be still appealing. They're a playoff team. They're a high-quality team. Okay. We talked about the 2020 season. I think... The GM construction, we're talking about the roster construction of the team, pretty good. Coaching throughout the season or, you know, management of the team throughout the season, reaching that full potential, questionable, but, you know, got it towards the end. Let's talk about the roster construction going into the 2022 season, to going into Overwatch 2. I don't really know what Overwatch 2 is going to look like. No one really, really knows. Everyone can speculate, you know, oh, like, this position will be more valuable or whatever. No one really fucking knows. Let's be honest. No one really knows. Let's talk about these decisions. Because you ended up with this roster. Did you upgrade your roster from last year? That's the main question that you have to ask yourself. Did you upgrade your roster from last year? And if so, how much? Because everyone should be looking to upgrade their roster from last year. Even if you had success, you should be looking to upgrade, in my opinion. Always be looking to improve the weaknesses in your roster. Okay. They lost Fury. This is really, really bad. <laughs> uh I, I am so sad that they lost Fury. Fury went somewhere else. Doesn't really matter where. You know, he was on a one-year contract or whatever, or he couldn't re-sign, whatever it may be. I would have got that year that kid on a two-year contract and, and tried to get him to play the next year, <gasps> unless he was terribly unhappy. But, you know, I would have really wanted Fury going into Overwatch 2 because I know how flexible he is, and I know how experienced Fury is. You still have Mag. Tank is going to be really confusing, but, you know... You got Mag still, who's, I, I think, just a great player, a great tank, but main tank player. I think he'll fit well into Overwatch 2. I don't know if he'll fit great into Overwatch 2, but pretty good as far as main tanks go. And you kept Assassin. This is the big pickup for me. I, I've always been really high on Happy. I've always really wanted to work with Happy. I think Happy is a great player. And I think this is because Ty Dollar has joined the team. Ty and Happy obviously have a really good relationship from Guangzhou Charge. Uh, I know, you know, just talking to Ty, we, we always had a really high regard for Happy as far as his hit scan ability and even his flexibility, uh, as well as how hard he works. Like, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the player overall. Um, I'm really happy with the, uh, the Happy pickup. This is a great pickup. He's an S tier hit scan player, in my opinion, and he has that flexibility. To me, he's similar to Lip. Lip is exceptional on Sombra, so similar to, like, say, Bird Ring or something like that, where you have that great hitscan player who can also flex on to Tracer, 
Uh, Happy has shown Sombra flexibility. You know, he's great on what he does, specifically with Ash, McCree, and Widow, you know, which should be good going into Overwatch 2, right? So I'm really happy they paired Decay with a high quality, really, really high quality DPS. Assassin, I think, is good to keep, you know? Maybe there was no one better, but it's always good to have that flex support there, but or flex DPS there, but I think Decay and Happy will definitely be their strongest lineup going into Overwatch 2, unless there's some huge meta thing. But I think even then, you put Happy on Tracer or Happy on whatever Decay's role previously was, and make Decay play the flex DPS, and, and that should be good, my opinion. But that's just my me going into the player quality thing, and I think Happy is so, so good. I think he's such a good high-quality player, much better than Assassin. So, really good pickup there. That's two-fifths of the roster that I think is solid. You know, I can never say tank is super solid, to be honest. Other than a few tanks, I can really never say tank is for sure. Ty Dollar knows the value <laughs> of uh, two great flex supports, I think, because of our success on Gladiators with Skewed and uh, Shu. So I wasn't really happy with the order of these pickups. Uh, oh, I guess Krillin joined later, but I think Vigilante is great. This was what they were missing before. I don't know how much Vigilante costs. I don't know, you know, all these things, but Vigilante is now available. There's much more available flex supports uh, this season, I feel like, compared to last season, where you had to all in on Shu, Violet, uh, you know, Luffy, Lastro, something like this. I, th I think there are a lot more available, and I think Vigilante is a really young, really good talent for Overwatch 2. Given that we don't know what Overwatch 2 is about, I know Vigilante is a hard grinder, really young kid, uh, and has, like, you know, been improving at an increasing rate. So I'm really, really happy about the, the, this pickup. I really honestly don't know much about opener, but they have clearly put, you know, like as much eggs into the support basket as possible. And they're relying on Vigilante as like the main, uh, the main dealer on, on this role. And then Krillin as like the secondary flex support, much like Skewed was, right? Um, and then you have Kalios. Uh, sorry, going back to the tank line. I actually think Kalios will be good in season two. I I'm actually like, I think this is a great pickup. I actually think this is a really, really good pickup, a really low-key pickup as well. I'm not sure how much it costs, but I'm really happy about this pickup. I think that there are only going to be a couple really, really good off tanks, or sorry, a couple really, really good tanks going into season uh, season five of Overwatch League on Overwatch 2. Only a couple. It's going to be Piggy, Hanbin, and Void, who are like surely... Like, I have no doubt in my mind that they are going to be really good because they've all shown really, really high flexibility and they've all shown the ability to play a main tank. Uh, Hanbin's, like, insane on... I think Hanbin is, like, the highest rated person, but right after that, Piggy, and then you have to put Void in this because his player quality is so high. So, Kalios, I think, is, like, really a sleeper pick for this type of position. I'm really happy about this. I don't know if it'll pan out. Again, Overwatch 2, really hard to speculate. Did they improve their roster? I think they upgraded their DPS. You only need one good DPS next to Decay, and then I think they upgraded their supports, but they still need that other really, really good support, in my opinion. Hopefully, they hit with Krillin or Opener. I'm not too high on either, but I, if there is going to be a hole on this team, it's going to randomly be the tank, as with every team in Overwatch 2, or it's going to be the second uh, support next to Vigilante, in my opinion. So... They still have some holes, but they have built in this direction, and they seem to be getting better and iterating more and more. So, as far as a Justice fan goes, if you're looking for results, man, your your team is is going from you know bottom tier to top tier really really fast, and I think they're gonna stay top tier for a while. Hopefully, they stay top tier for a while, even if you know there are rumors that Decay is leaving or whatever. They have positioned themselves good that they are, you know, a strong Korean team that pays really well. That's a really good reputation to have. That's a really good position to have. They're not differentiated by much, but, you know, that's where the talent comes for being a head coach, for being a, a scouter, for being the roster constructor. That's where you need to, like, differentiate yourself and build a really, really good roster by yourself. I think Tidala um, and Supreme have done a really good job here uh, in iterating on the next version of the roster. So there we have it. That's everything that we've talked about uh, from, you know, Washington Justice's past, how they made the 2021 decisions, how they have done in the season, and kind of where that leads them going to 2022. Let me, uh, let me end this video by saying if there's any team that you guys want me to do this for, uh, let me know. Uh, I can talk about Gladiators, but I'm afraid of going too in-depth. Uh, I, you know, I still know players on the team. 
uh, stuff like that. I know too much about uh, Gladiators, but if there's other teams you guys want me to analyze, kind of go through, let me know in the comments uh, who you guys want me to analyze. This is, again, just an outside looking in. I don't know anything about the business decisions or anything behind that. There are a lot of reasons why players get picked up. I'm purely talking from, you know, again, a competitive side. How are, are you doing? What is your position? What are you trying to achieve? Type of thing. So, let me know what team you guys want me to do next. Until next time, thanks, guys. Uh, have a good day.